All right, let's talk about it. The time has come to go over the different statistics that you need to know for the AAQ. Now for this video, we are going to be focusing specifically on part C of the AAQ, which is describe the meaning of insert the specific concept here. For this part of the AAQ, you may have to talk about the mean, the median, the mode, range, standard deviation, percentile rank, skewness, correlation, coefficients, effect size, or statistical significance. Now, before we go over each of these different statistics, I want to bring your attention to the fact that part C is a describe question, which means you cannot simply identify the statistic. You need to show how the statistic connects with the research. So make sure when answering the AAQ, you show the reader that you understand what the statistic means in the context of the study. Now, for this video, I'm going to give you a quick review on each of these different statistics, but make Make sure that you spend time practicing them and understand how to interpret them on an actual AAQ. Also remember, if you want to take practice quizzes on these different statistics, you can find resources inside my ultimate review packet, where I have a quiz on testing the hypothesis, correlational studies, central tendencies, measures of variability, standard deviation, qualitative and quantitative data, and interpreting tables, graphs, and charts in psychology. Plus, if you need more practice, you can check out my exam Slayer, which has practice AAQs for each unit, full practice AP exams, an exam simulator, and AAQ and EBQ videos, all to help you prepare for the national exam. All right, up first, let's start with the central tendency, which is the mean, mode, and medium. The mean is the average of the data set. To find this, you would take the sum of all of your values and then divide by the amount of values you added together. So the mean is an average of the data set. And this is what tells you where the center of the data lies. One thing you need to remember is that the mean is easily affected by outliers. So be on the lookout for data that might be misleading due to the data having an outlier. Speaking of outliers, you also want to remember that as more data is collected, it's likely that you will see a regression towards the mean. A regression toward the mean happens when outliers, such as very high outliers or very low outliers, are followed by results that are closer to the average. Average. For instance, let's say that you play basketball and you usually score around 15 points per game, but tonight you have an amazing game and you end up scoring 30 points. This is most likely due to your skill, but also luck. Over the next few games, you go back to scoring 15 points per game. This is an example of a regression to the mean. We can see that your outlier game was most likely influenced by luck, such as the other team not playing well and your typical performance comes back in future games. Regression to the mean can also occur if you are below the mean. For instance, if I played another game of basketball and only scored five points, it is likely that the next game my luck would improve and I would score closer back to the mean. So we can see that the more extreme the outlier is, the more regression is likely to occur. Okay, so that's enough talk about the mean. Let's now move on to the mode. To find the mode, you want to look for the value that occurs most often. Whichever value occurs the most, is the mode. The mode is the most helpful when looking at categorical data. For instance, which therapy method is the most common? Or if you want to know the most typical or popular response. Lastly, there is median, which you will use when you want to find the score that is at the exact middle of the data set. To find the median, you need to organize your data in order of smallest to largest. If you have an odd amount of values, you take the value that is in the middle. And if you have an even amount of values, then you add up the two values in the middle and divide by two. Remember, unlike the mean, the median is not affected by extreme outliers. We can also see that the central tendency can connect into skewness. Remember, if there is a symmetrical distribution, it means that the mean, the median, and mode all coincide at the center point. If there is a right skew, which would be positive, it means that the mode is usually at the peak of the distribution. The median is located to the right of the mode, and the mean is located to the right of the median. Lastly, if there is a left skew, which would be negative, it means that the mode is usually at the peak of the distribution again. Now the median though is located to the left of the mode, while the mean is located farther to the left of the median. Alright, so since we started talking about distribution, we need to review measures of variability, which include range and standard deviation. The next stats that you need to be familiar with for part C of the AAQ. To calculate the range, you need to take the highest value point and the lowest value point and subtract them. 
them. Range shows the difference between the two points. Remember, range is affected by extreme scores. Essentially, range is just showing us the span of the data set, allowing you to see how much scores vary. Standard deviation, on the other hand, allows researchers to indicate the average distance from the mean for a data set. For AP Psychology, you do not have to worry about calculating the standard deviation, but be familiar with the different distributions that can occur. Here we can see the mean, median, and mode come back. Remember, we just reviewed these concepts. Sometimes you may see a normal distribution, which takes the shape with a symmetrical bell-shaped curve. When this happens, it means there is just one mode, and the mean, median, and mode are all located at the center of the distribution at the zero point value. Now, when looking at distributions, we can see that a normal distribution is not the most common frequency distribution. It's much more common that data will have a positive or negative skew. Remember, a positive skew occurs when scores are low and clustered to the left of the mean, while a negative skew has high scores that are clustered to the right of the mean. Now, you also might see a bimodal distribution, which is when distribution has two modes, causing the distribution to have two peaks. Speaking of distributions, realize that the z-score on the bottom of the distribution just shows how many standard deviations a particular score is from the average or mean. We can see in a normal distribution, a positive z-score is higher than the mean, and a negative z-score indicates that the score is lower than the mean. Generally, z-scores allow us to compare things that are not the same, as long as they are normal normally distributed. And this connects into our next statistic, which is percentile rank, which remember is the percentage of scores at or below a particular score. Essentially, this is what tells you what percentage of the population has a score or value that's the same or lower than yours, which can be calculated in a normal distribution. When interpreting percentile ranks, remember that the median is the 50th percentile, meaning half the data is above and half the data is below. For instance, say you went to the doctor and find out that you are in the 73rd percentile for height. This means that 73% of people your age are shorter than or equal in height to you, while 27% of people your age are as tall or taller than you. All right, up next we have correlation coefficients, which are used with correlational studies. Correlations allow us to make predictions on what will happen in a study. But remember, correlation does not mean causation. When analyzing the results of a correlational study, you will examine and the correlation coefficient. The closer this value is to either positive one or negative one, the stronger the relationship between the two variables. A coefficient between zero and one indicates that as one variable increases, the other increases as well. This is known as a positive correlation or positive relationship, which when plotted on a scatter plot would appear as an upward trend. On the other hand, a correlation coefficient between zero and negative one indicates that as one variable increases, Increases, the other decreases, showing an inverse relationship. This is known as a negative correlation or negative relationship, which when plotted on a scatter plot would appear as a downward trend. If there is no correlation, it means there is no relationship between the variables, and the data points on the scatter plot will be scattered randomly. Up next, we have p-value, which provides insight into the statistical significance of a study's results. The p-value can range anywhere from 0 to 1. If a p-value is less than or equal to 0 0.05, the results of the study are statistically significant, which means that the results of the study were most likely not caused by chance or luck. The smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence is against the null hypothesis, while on the other hand, the larger the p-value, the more likely it is that the results of the experiment were due to chance. For instance, a p-value of 0 0.90 would mean there's a 90% chance that the results were due to luck. So we should reject the alternative hypothesis and accept the null hypothesis. For the AP test, you don't need to worry about calculating the p-value, but you do want to make sure that you are familiar with statistical significance. All right, now the last concept that you need to be familiar with for part C is effect size. This is what tells us the strength of a relationship between variables. Unlike the p-value, effect size tells us how meaningful the effect is in real-world terms. For instance, in a study comparing two groups, a large effect size means there is a substantial difference between the groups, while a small effect size indicates a more minor difference. Let's say we are looking at the results of a study that was examining whether a new therapy reduces anxiety. 
The p-value for the study is 0.05, which tells us that the therapy likely has an effect, since the results are statistically significant. At the same time, we see that the effect size for the study is small, which tells us that while the therapy most likely reduced anxiety, the improvement may be minimal in practical terms. When remembering the difference between effect size and statistical significance, just remember that effect size tells us how big or meaningful the difference or relationship is in a study while statistical significance tells us whether that difference is likely real or just due to chance. Statistical significance show us if the results matter, and effect size shows us how much they matter in real life. All right, so there you have it. Those are the different statistics that you may see on part C of the AAQ. Now comes the time to practice. Don't forget to check out the different practice quizzes on all of these different concepts in my ultimate review packet. And check out the exam slayer for unit exams and AAQ. As always, thank you all so much for watching. I'm Mr. Sin, and until next time, I'll see you online.